de Naciones Unidas. Como diplomático, Richardson participó en el rescate de rehenes estadounidenses en Venezuela y fue mediador internacional por la paz, lo que le valió recibir cuatro nominaciones al Premio Nobel de la Paz. En 2002 fue elegido gobernador de Nuevo México, convirtiéndose así en el primer gobernador hispano en los Estados Unidos. Recibamos con un fuerte aplauso, con la calidez tijuanense que nos caracteriza, al ex gobernador de Nuevo México, el señor Bill Richardson. Bienvenido, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Qué bonita introducción, ¿eh? Todo era verdad, ¿eh? Primero, es un honor estar aquí en Tijuana otra vez. Eh, creo que es mi sexta visita. Cuando era secretario de Energía del gobierno del presidente Clinton, estuve aquí. Como embajador de Naciones Unidas, estuve aquí. Y últimamente, como gobernador de Nuevo México... Me acuerdo de mi amigo, el gobernador El Ordu y el gobernador Osorio, uh, pero para mí el tema principal de esta conferencia es muy importante. Es acerca de, de la diáspora mexicana, acerca del puente de entendimiento entre naciones que están creando día con día quienes han migrado a otros países, pero no se han olvidado de las oportunidades que ofrece México. Yo nací en California, mi padre era americano y mi madre mexicana. Mi hermana es secretaria de Salud del Estado de Morelos. Yo crecí y estudié en México hasta la secundaria. Jugué béisbol en la Liga Infantil Mexicana y siempre perdíamos contra Baja California. Cuando empecé mi carrera pública en Estados Unidos, las relaciones con México fueron algo que se empezó a dar naturalmente por mi exper experiencia y mis raíces. Una cultura que para mis colegas en el Congreso americano, fui congresista 14 años por Nuevo México, y en el gobierno eran tan ajena para mí resultaba muy familiar y me era fácil tender nexos y lazos y resolver diferencias. Tan es así que desempeñé un papel central en la negociación del NAFTA o el Tratado de Libre Comercio. Con el electorado hispano, el conocimiento de la cultura y mi idioma siempre me facilitó traducir en política las necesidades de la comunidad hispana en Estados Unidos, que está creciendo tanto. Cuando fui gobernador de Nuevo México, el comercio entre mi estado y nuestro vecino, Chihuahua, creció exponencialmente. Y el intercambio en materia de seguridad, salud, energía y medio ambiente fue más fuerte que nunca. Les voy a dar unas estadistas, estadísticas sobre la presencia hispana en Estados Unidos. Uno de cada cinco mexicanos vive en Estados Unidos, la mayoría con un promedio de edad de entre 18 y 25 años, una comunidad joven y dinámica. Envían alrededor de 20 mil millones de dólares anuales a México en remesas. 14 millones de mexicanos viven en su estado vecino, en California. El 47% de la población de mi estado en Nuevo México son hispanos, la cifra más grande de cualquier estado, 47%. El 11% de los americanos en Estados Unidos son de origen mexicano. Por eso dicen que el próximo presidente de Estados Unidos va a ser elegido por el voto hispano. Pero lo que me gusta más de esta conferencia es la mantra que me han dicho de innovadora. Primero, 
en Tijuana, innovadora, el único protagonista es Tijuana. The star of the show is Tijuana. There are no other stars. It's not about individuals. It's not about companies. It's about Tijuana. Number two, en Tijuana Innovadora, cuando decimos algo, lo tenemos que cumplir. In other words, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Number three, número tres, en Tijuana Innovadora, no hacemos las cosas por dinero, las hacemos por respeto. Reset, respeto por nosotros mismos y respeto por Tijuana. We don't do it for the money, we do it for respect. Now, I want to thank Jose Galicot. I haven't met him yet, but I hear he's quite a guy. I hope he hasn't left yet. But I had dinner with his children last night, with Aye Galicot and Gregorio Galicot, who told me about this conference. And Al Gore had told me he had been here. And you'd have every CEO of major American technology companies here. I want to thank Jorge Izquierdo, who organized my visit, Juan Carlos Sanchez, an attorney here, But I want to just say again, what you have done with this conference is you've done something that El Paso, that other border cities have tried to do but haven't done. You've brought people together in a diaspora of excellence and cooperation. You're thinking regionally. You know, I have a unique connection to Tijuana. And I said basically last night, maybe I'm an example of this diaspora, a Mexican-American with deep roots in Mexico, born in the U.S., who's been in politics in the United States. One of the things that was not mentioned in the introduction was I ran for president of the United States. But I didn't do too well, so let's forget about that. Duré tres primarias. That was the year Clinton, Obama. That was a little tough year for me. But I was in there, and I was in the debates, and they called me El Candidato Hispano, with the name Richardson was a little difficult. But nonetheless, and I thought of using my mother's name, Lopez, Bill Richardson Lopez, but I thought, no, that'd be overdoing it. But I have a unique connection to Tijuana. My sister, Vesta, lived and worked in Tijuana over 20 years ago, where she served as a pediatrician while also volunteering her time, working in close collaboration with Dr. Betty Jones to help realize a dream. So many Tijuaneses or Tijuaneros, I'll find out how to say it, had back then, Tijuaneros, Tijuaneses, okay, had been back then to have a local children's hospital. Today, as most of you know, Hospital Infantil de las Californias is now 20 years old and remains Baja California's only private children's hospital with 26 pediatric specialties caring for kids from across the state, including children and youth from Southern California, thanks to generosity from both sides of the border and Canada, too. I'm very proud of my sister's support of the children of Tijuana as well as the tremendous success that Hospital Infantil of the Californias has had these last 20 years under the tireless leadership of Dr. Betty Jones and Dr. Gabriel Chong. Hospital Infantil de las Californias, after all, is a symbol of what is possible when one thinks big and keeps one's dreams alive. It's a symbol of NAFTA, of the TLC, namely broad-based, trinational collaboration that so many of us in this room fought very hard to make real. Now, the same can be said for Tijuana Innovadora, a civic movement showcasing the best in Tijuana's innovation in the arts of technology, healthcare, manufacturing, philanthropy, 
and even the culinary arts. As you may know, Tijuana Innovadora came into being because of one man, Don Jose Galicot. Let's give Jose a big hand. You, you've probably done that already. Oye, Jose, no te has ido, no te veo, eh? ¿Dónde estás? Ah, ahí estás. <laughs> Your kids are very proud of you, and very rightly so. So this evening, I want to speak to you about the importance of thinking big, of staying positive, and keeping your dreams alive even when the going gets tough. You know, as you may know, Tijuana Innovadora came into being because it dared to dream big, to go against the tides of conventional wisdom to put Tijuana back on the map when most were turning their backs on Tijuana on this great border metropolis of close to two million people. And you want to remember those that have been with you when things were not good. When you're doing well, let me tell you, in politics, everybody is your friend. But when you're not, that's when you find out who your real friends are. I want to talk to you about staying positive. I want to talk to you about the vital importance of extended binational collaboration between the United States and Mexico. It's not just the border. You do it well here, but I think you have to help the entire country and my country, both my countries, to work closer together. And it's not just government. It's business, it's civil society, it's academia, especially also the new opportunities, and there's some new opportunities here in the San Diego Imperial Baja California region, the region that has recently been branded the Cali Baja Mega region. You should try to shorten that, but what the heck. That is going to work if you work collectively and think big. First of all, you're ideally positioned to take advantage with this close geographic proximity to San Diego and the broader Southern California market to further strengthen its leadership position as one of Mexico's most dynamic and technologically focused regions in the country. Today, the county of Imperial and neighboring Mexicali are similar positioned to be a regional leader in a new area. And my main message is this new opportunity for you. It's called energy. You can become a leader in renewable energy, in solar, wind, in geothermal, and biofuels. I'm a consultant today to a Spanish company called Avengoa that is doing a concentrated solar project in the Mexicali area. And that's going to be one of many that you will see because of this new energy reform in Mexico that the legislature has passed. Take advantage of that. Collectively, the Cali Baja region represents a population of 6.5 million, a GDP of 202 billion, billion, and a labor force of 3.1 million people. A good labor force, well-trained, I've seen just walking the streets how people are in a rush. It's like in New York City. They bump into other people. They push them aside. That's good. That means dynamic energy. But just don't overdo it, especially when you're driving. Now, what I wanted to say is also that economically speaking, this combined region would rank number 25 it were, if it were a single American state. Number 25. So right in the middle of the 50 U.S. states. While unique opportunities clearly do exist here in Tijuana and the broader region, their historic, political, cultural, language, psychological, and physical barriers that continue to divide your region from realizing its true potential. You know that. That's why you have these town meetings of Innovadora. I think every Wednesday you get people, anybody that wants to talk, I think that's remarkable. I used to do that as governor. I'd let people come in to see me, no appointment, five minutes. They had to get out after five minutes, but they couldn't bring in a weapon. Now, you laugh, but I used to get a lot of people that wanted 
executive pardons. Se habían portado mal. So we had to do a vetting of that. But I think that's a great grassroots opportunity. As a community, you all know too well what I'm talking about. As you saw your neighbor in the United States turn its back on you a few years ago, San Diego, leading to a drop in commerce and trade and tourism due to border delays, public perceptions of public safety, and I might add politically motivated racial prejudice tied to the conventional issue of immigration reform in the United States. And that is something we need to do in America, broad immigration reform. It's good for my country, it's good for your country, it's good jobs, it's commerce, it's reducing the deficit, it creates jobs, it's good for our countries. It shouldn't just be viewed as an immigration issue. And for those politicians opposing immigration reform, Tijuana and specifically the border fence or wall between San Diego and Tijuana was used as a convenient political backdrop of everything that was wrong with a binational relationship. The focus of this narrative has been about illegal crossings, drug trafficking, and narco violence. Totally neglected from this one-sided dialogue was the cross-border interrelationship that exists between San Diego and Tijuana, and to a larger extent, the Cali Baja region. One of the reasons why I'm so proud to be here is that this evening is because I know that Tijuana Innovadora is working hard to counteract this bad stilted, inaccurate image to help show not just San Diego, but the world at large, the true face of Tijuana. I speak to you from experience, having served as a two-term governor for the border state of New Mexico, which has its own aspirations for a brighter future through expanded cross-border collaboration with the neighboring Mexican state of Chihuahua. I served in Congress for several years, but I remember those days that we debated NAFTA. I used to ask my friends that wanted to vote against the TLC, what are you afraid of Mexico? Why do you see these vast differences? Why do you see Mexico in the context of uh, violence and, 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 and lawlessness? This is a dynamic country that is a neighbor and a friend. So I'm not discounting the importance of homeland security. It's worth noting that the triple border fence dividing the 14-mile section of the San Juan-Tijuana border was built at a cost of over $9 million a mile. Perhaps a better allocation of funding was more direct foreign assistance to address the challenges of urban poverty and economic inequality in this city. But to be fair, the USAID has stepped up its level of social investment in Tijuana as part of the fourth leg of the stool for the Medida Initiative, including support youth-based programs in Tijuana to support the efforts of Mexican young people to build communities and pathways to leadership, learning, productive livelihoods. So, looking towards the future, I see great potential for this region. For starters, your region is making tremendous progress in speeding the flow of traffic at the San Isidro border crossing, which, as you well know, is the busiest border crossing in the world. It took me six minutes to come in. I landed at San Diego Airport. I came in. Nobody asked me for my ID. Nobody asked me for my passport. I said, where am I? Am I still in San Diego? No, you're in Tijuana. I mean, whatever you did there is good. Now, I understand they're going to ask for my passport on the way back, but you can't have it all. But that is good. That is smart. That is efficiency. Whoever thought of that, probably at Innovadora, makes a lot of sense. I remember when it would take over three and a half hours to cross, but no longer. Today, the average border time is under 10 minutes. It took me six. I timed it. That's progress. Related to this, I understand that within a year, you're going to have a completed cross-border air terminal, which will no doubt result in expanded U.S. air travel to Mexico, but also will increase overall commerce for Tijuana. Now, let me talk to you about something that's very good that happened here. And when I say this, people say to me, 
God, you sound like a cheerleader for President Peña Nieto. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, you know, after years of defending Mexico because energy reform didn't happen or there were problems, I'm going to give his administration a lot of credit in passing energy reform, assembling the three parties in a coalition, getting it through the Congress, changing the Constitution, and focusing on private investment, joint private investment, not just the U.S. Uh, this is going to bring opportunities for the whole region, for the whole country. But you here, as neighbors to California, which has the most advanced energy reforms in the country, promoting renewable energy, green energy, energy efficiency, they discourage fossil fuels, and has this huge population, I think you need to find ways to develop these energy resources. Now, the recent energy reform legislation will open up these opportunities for expanded foreign investment in this area, which all you have to do is walk around here and see the foreign investment. Why? Location, location, location because of where California sits on the Mexican grid. It's at the end of the line, and so you pay some of the highest costs for energy in all of Mexico. But also because of where you sit on the grid, you have the opportunity to become a net energy exporter to California, your neighbor, a net energy exporter, one of the largest energy markets in the world, California. Thus, there are emerging cross-border opportunities in the areas of biotechnology, as well as cross-border medical research. Increasingly, I'm hearing more and more about clinical trials being undertaken in Tijuana because of its close proximity to the cluster of biotech companies in the San Diego area. And with a growing convergence of healthcare with wireless technology in mobile health, or M Health, San Diego and Tijuana are uniquely positioned. There are a lot of very good health examples of M Health occurring in the region where applications related to chronic disease and diabetes, cervical cancer screening, and tuberculosis prevention and control. Haije mentioned to me last night that this is how Tijuana Innovadora was originally conceived. When her father realized that Tijuana is the world leader in medical device manufacturing, heart valves, and that nobody knew about it. This is, I think, a real, real center of technology research. But of course you know all this, and you're saying, why is this gringo politician telling us what to do? I'm not. I'm just pointing out these great assets that you have this great momentum in this new era in Mexico of energy reform, of the growth in the American economy, the dynamism of California, and Governor Jerry Brown, very pro-energy, very pro-solar. He was one of the first innovators of renewable energy when he was governor 150 years ago. No, no, it's cierto. <laughs> Jerry will hear about this and he'll send me a nasty note. But he has been around a long time, pero sabe mucho de energía solar, técnico, he's very good. And he cares about this border. And recently, the University of California, San Diego, published a report on this topic entitled Borderless Biotech and Mexico's Emergency, Emerging Life Science Industry. Now, uh, my fourth point, San Diegans from all walks of life, guess what? they're returning to Tijuana. How many here came from San Diego tonight? Looks like a lot, pero no veo nada, eh? <laughs> ¿Qué, ¿Qué hay gente escuchándome o no? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's, that's very impressive. You know, it's not just business and civic leaders that are getting reengaged and reconnected. The city of San Diego is reinvesting in its sister city relationship with Tijuana. You know, uh, college students from institutions like San Diego State University, SDSU, UC San Diego, 
are now re-engaging with academic college, colleagues finally in Baja California after a travel ban was lifted. Tourism is coming back. The rebirth of Tijuana was recently highlighted in a feature story in the New York Times. Read that article in the New York Times. It was like about four days ago by this guy named, guy named Sam, Sam Quiñones. Excellent story about Tijuana. You must have given him some carnitas muy ricas. You must have taken care of this guy. But it's a fabulous story. And the New York Times lo publican all over the world. I mean, it, I said, my God, I'm going to be there. I've already had, I've already, the three of the restaurants he's talked about, I've been to already in an eight-hour period. I said, but close. Now, on the philanthropic front, Richard Kai, who heads up the International Community Foundation, has told me that giving among San Diego area donors is now in the upswing after a downturn of giving to Tijuana over the past several years. His foundation is very active. He's a big supporter, Richard Kai, of this area. Lo conocen a Richard, no? O me están aplaudiendo a mí, Richard. Well, I'm going to conclude now. They told me 40 minutes, but I'm on my 32nd minute. Ya voy a acabar. And if you want to take questions, I'll be glad to do it. But I understand that you've got, you're very precise. You said I would be on at a certain time, and I have been. Finally, I'll turn once again to Tijuana Innovadora. This biannual event is playing a very important role in rebuilding the binational social capital in the cross-border region between Tijuana, between neighboring San Diego, is the broader Cali Baja region. You know, I really applaud you for your community-based leadership in helping to promote and build an esprit de corps of pride in this region. You know, as you can see, there's great potential here in Tijuana. But I'm going to tell you a saying there's no greater burden than a great potential. You actually have to do it. And this is, I think, a mantra of Innovadora. So, ahora sí, ya voy a acabar. That said, you have many challenges ahead as you compete with other regions of the world for commerce and trade and you confront the multitude of cross-border challenges that your community is now familiar with in the areas of the environment, water and energy security, public health, education, urban and regional planning. Such cross-border challenges, however, will be far to easier to tackle regionally if they are done together with neighboring San Diego. Gregorio, who is the son of Don Jose, also spoke to me about the interconnection between San Diego and Tijuana. You know, you live in one place, you come every day, you move back and forth, uh, seamless. And I think that's the key to progress. That's the key to your key, most important asset. So what am I here to tell you something you already know? I am thinking of something new. And what I think is a real peg in your economic future is energy. With these energy reforms, you're going to see dramatic investments in renewable energy. Everybody's talking about shale gas, and yeah, that's important. Everybody's talking about that revolution, how America is now uh, developing shale gas, and it's the biggest energy power in the world. That's true. But shale gas is going to be a bridge to renewable fuels and renewable energy. So it's going to be about solar, wind, and biofuel. I'm telling you this. And at the border, you know, with your water, with your transportation, with your infrastructure, there is no more viable new industry that will attract joint investment. I'm just not just saying the U.S. I know you prefer the U.S., and I'm not discouraging you from that. But this is going to mean that Spain and the European Union and China and Taiwan, they're going to be coming out here. And you should always do what's best for the region. But then, naturally, you've got California. 
You've got this state that is the biggest in the United States population-wise, the economically strongest state, the state with the most dynamic energy policy, I believe. Did you know that California is the number one or number two oil and gas producer? I mean, you think of California, the number one agriculture producer. You think of California's movies and tourism and, and transportation. But, but I think you have this enormous potential to garner this new energy dimension. So I know you're talking about biotechnology. I know you're talking about culture. And I've seen the new museum and medical technology and tourism. But you've been a center of innovation before a lot of people talked about it and became one. You did these valves. You did this biotechnology. You did it because of your location. You did it because of the technology here and the innovation and the universities. So uh, I'm looking at probably the most dynamic region in Mexico. And I'll close because for years, as a Mexican-American, I was tired of always having to defend Mexico. I say that because I get criticized. Well, Richard said, you know, you want NAFTA because you were born in, you're in the U.S., but your mom's Mexican, you played baseball there. Uh, you're really a Mexican at heart. Well, you know, maybe so. Maybe half of me is. But now when the government does well and passes good legislation like energy reform and, and education reform and... You know, the parties seem to be getting well together. I know there's a violence issue, uh, but I think the, the government is right in attacking the violence rather than going to war with all these cartels. I think you've got to do both. But you've got to be strategic in how you deal with this problem. And I think here in Tijuana, you have made major strides in all of these areas. So, look, I am so happy to be here. I really mean it. Uh, I, I thought... Oh, my God, I, geez, how, how long is it going to take us from San Diego Airport? I, had, I gave a speech in Miami, and I went to Dallas, and then I went to San Diego. Jesus, ya estaba muerto, you know, after t 10 hours. I said, now, now we got to go across the border. My God, I, I want to go to sleep. And we got out of the airport in San Diego. We came in, and I was at my hotel. I said, well, wh where's the border? I got my passport. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I said, well, geez, that's, that's great. Of course, I had a... Tenía una patrulla que me estaba ayudando. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. We're very uh, glad and proud to have you here. Do you, uh, we have a, a Q&A session right now. Do you want to... Do, do you want the questions in English or Spanish? En español. Perfecto. Porque a mí me las hacen, me las hacen llegar en español. Existe a nivel mundial un incremento en la inmigración. ¿Podría compartir con nosotros cuáles piensa que son las causas, si esto es algo bueno y si no, cómo se puede revertir o limitar? Bueno, para mí, el legato principal del presidente Obama en sus últimos dos años va a ser aprobar una reforma migratoria que tenga dos componentes claves. El primero sería, pues sí, uh, tener pues en la frontera, uh, incrementar la seguridad, uh, la violencia, etcétera. Pero segundo, darle una oportunidad a, las 11, a los 11 millones mexicanos que viven en Estados Unidos de salir de las sombras, porque ellos trabajan en Estados Unidos, participan cívicamente. Uh, yo como gobernador de, me, de Nuevo México fui el primer gobernador que inició en mi estado dándoles licencias a los inmigrantes que estaban ahí legales, licencias de conducir, porque ayudaba eso a la seguridad. Había menos accidentes, se inscribían más en aseguranzas. Fui el primer gobernador que aprobó un Dream Act, a los inmigrantes que iban a universidades en Estados Unidos. Yo creo que es importante integrar en la sociedad americana a esos 11 millones, pero no darles gratis necesariamente ciudadanía, que 
varias iniciativas que puedan, por ejemplo, aprender inglés, que no tengan delitos, que, que tengan un background check, que sepan de la sociedad americana, la historia americana, pero que, re, que encuentren una manera de, de tener sus raíces mexicanas también. Y estoy pues muy decepcionado con el discurso político en Estados Unidos, que ven a esos inmigrantes con, con ese miedo que me veían a mí cuando estaba argumentando a favor del Tratado de Libre Comercio. Yo creo que sí, eventualmente, por razones políticas, va a ser aprobado. Porque si el Partido Republicano no ve que el voto hispano es importante y sigue, no todos, no todos, hay unos que no tienen esta posición, pero la mayoría, si siguen impulsando uh, que no tenemos uh, necesidad de inmigración, uh, de reforma migratoria, que la carrera presidencial en 2016 va a ayudar mucho al Partido Demócrata, aunque esta elección en tres semanas, como demócrata, yo les voy a decir, no nos va a ir muy bien, pero en cuatro años, cuando sea la elección, en dos años, tres años presidencial, yo creo que el Partido Republicano va a ver la necesidad de tener un compromiso con los demócratas para aprobar la reforma migratoria, que creo que es una iniciativa muy importante y a ustedes aquí les afecta directamente aquí. Bien, esta pregunta me llegó en inglés. Todos, todos aquí tienen traductor, ¿verdad? La gente que no entiende eh, inglés. ¿Sí? Bien. As a former governor of a border state, what virtues do you see in a region that may facilitate the development of important projects that were not possible in New Mexico to advance economically and socially? Oye, me, me dio tantito de miedo que preguntase si alguien hablaba inglés, entonces no me entendieron nada. ¿eh? Pero sí todo, yo sé todos ustedes hablan inglés. No, my answer is, you know, in New Mexico, we're a small state. Uh, Chihuahua is a big state. We had Juarez, El Paso on our border with Las Cruces. So what we did was we concentrated on security issues. We developed uh, cross-border crossings that you have a lot of them. We didn't have hardly any. Uh, Mr. Juan Massey, who is here, a Mexican-American, uh, ran a lot of my U.S.-Mexico border out. He's sitting in back. Ya se me durmió. Despiértate, hombre. You of anybody should wake up. He's heard this before. Um, so we had this uh, very dynamic. We set up air service. Didn't work out too well between Albuquerque and Chihuahua, because a lot of our immigrants were from Chihuahua. Uh, it, it operates intermittently, but we thought a daily flight, but we were a little bit ahead of our time. Um, you here, on the other hand, you have all the assets. You have the infrastructure. You've got the population. You've got the universities. You have the biotechnology. What you don't have is what I said before, energy, renewable energy. Take advantage of that. Go to San Diego. Get some, you know, get into the grid. My God, you're paying some of the highest energy prices. But if you develop your own grid, and California is your market, even southern, just southern California, you're going to be in very good shape. Your prices will go down. And then you create a lot of green jobs for these young people that you want them to stay here in Tijuana and Mexicali and not all of them go to the U.S. Uh, stay here. Develop the young people here, the young infrastructure, the schools, the teachers. Que se quedan aquí. I'm not saying don't go both ways. I'm saying, you know, you want to develop your own technical infrastructure, youth-based. Tenemos otra pregunta en inglés. How will the U.S. look like in 2027 when white people become minority as it is projected? Will the Republican Party evolve to embrace this new country or will it be devoured by the Tea Party and slowly die because it failed to accept its new reality? Oye, pues, ¿quién hizo esa pregunta? I'm very impressed, eh? Ahí está. Yeah. Who made this question? No, no, I, she's right back there. I, I think that's a person, CCS. Well, you know, that was, that's an excellent question because 
The Tea Party, I believe, is not good. They're anti-immigrant. They're anti-government. They're anti-everything. Están enojados for some reason. And they tap into this feeling that the government doesn't work. Okay, well, sometimes you know it doesn't. That doesn't mean that there are people that don't need government. They do. They need schools. They need health care, protection from crime. And so government can play a role, but government has to work with the private sector. And the Tea Party has found a way to control the Republican Party. Not everybody, because there's some very good Republicans. Uh, there's some moderates. You know, in these days, do you know George W. Bush is a moderate compared to the Tea Party today? Ronald Reagan, he had an amnesty of three million undocumented workers. I voted for that. In 1986, you know, here's the, he's a very strong conservative, but he was. So the, my hope is that the Republican Party evolves into a moderate party that it used to be. But if it doesn't, if they keep up this anti-immigrant Tea Party stuff, maybe they'll get through this election here. Because if you look at redistricting and reapportionment, this election won't be settled by Latinos, the one in three weeks. No. But a national election with the electorate of Latinos growing, uh, not just in states like California and New Mexico, but Hispanics are growing in every state, in Arkansas, in North Carolina. You know, they're 7%, they're up to 11%, 14%. They're going to be huge players. And, and, and I think you're, you're right. Do you, do you want to add to what I said? ¿Quieres decir algo? Comentario sobre lo que yo dije? Sí. Say it. ¿Se me escuchó? ¿Se me... ¿Ya? Sí, ah. sí. Que... I do believe that the Republican Party needs to evolve because Latinos, we're going to grow, we're going to be... Um, it, well, white people are going to become a minority and they need to embrace that we are there as a diaspora to help, to bring a lot of things, not to suck on all the resources that they have and we want to help to build that country to be better and to also help Mexico back because we really love our country and we want this region to be more powerful than maybe China and that Mexico, uh, United States become that powerful region that we can become if we work together. Excellent. Very good. You know, and I, look, I'm, I'm a very strong Democrat, but I realize to get anything done, you need Republicans. One party can't do it. If you look at America's great legislative accomplishments, the uh, interstate transportation highway system, the Wilderness Acts, uh, you know, uniquely the Gulf War, uh, it was always done on a bipartisan basis. I, I will tell you also that uh, El Tratado de Libre Comercio wouldn't have been approved without Republicans. They were bigger supporters than Democrats. Clinton pushed it, but it was started by George Bush, el primero. So the Republican Party has some good factions that are good for you. Free trade, commerce. Uh, Democrats also, but, you know, I got to give credit. I remember the NAFTA vote in the House of Representatives, uh, 220 votes in favor, uh, 100, uh, a very substantial majority of those were Republican votes. I was getting Democratic votes, and, you know, Clinton was very much behind it. So, look, there are good sides to both parties, and what you need to do, you need to work with whoever is in power. However, California is a Democratic state. I don't think that's going to change. All you have to do is look at the uh, demographics, more Latinos, uh, more minorities, more young people moving there, more Asians, and they tend to be uh, more democratic. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you don't work with both sides. And one of the things that, that Peña Nieto did when he passed a lot of his legislation, 
he had those three parties come together and say, okay, we're going to work together and pass this, the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD. Now the PRD, I think, is, is out. But that was a master stroke. And I remember saying in the U.S., you know, we should have done this with Republicans, but we're too divided right now. We're going through a very difficult phase of divided government. And if the Republicans take over the U.S. Senate, I, I don't think they will, but they very well might by one. Then it'll be divided government again for the next two years. And, and a lot of good legislation like climate change, immigration, will be in jeopardy that it won't get done. Okay, I'm sorry, this comes from that same person, but I think it's a wonderful question, so I'm going to uh, have it here. Why is it is that after almost 200 years, there is still a great divide in the U.S. between the North and the South? What is the reason that states that, you, that used to be from Mexico are so against immigration? No, eso no es cierto. Who asked that? The same, the same one, oh, the same no, person. A ver, a ver ¿cómo, ¿cómo estableces eso? Que, por ejemplo, los, los Estados del Sur vote more Republican? Or is that what you mean? Well, that is partially true. <laughs> but, um, you know, those states, dime un estado ahorita que, que está referen de referencia. Georgia, North Carolina, ¿cuál de ellos? Arizona. Que sabes más, ¿cuál? Arizona. Which one? Arizona. No, hombre, that's not the south. That's southwest. Okay, Louisiana. You know, Georgia. The, the pot, North Carolina, the Hispanic population is growing in North Florida. You know, there's the Cuban Americans, but the majority of Latinos in Florida are not Cuban Americans. They're Central Americans, they're Puerto Rican, they're South American origin. Poquito más de los cubanos. And those vote Democratic. I, I know what you're saying. You know, Arizona's 25% is Latino. But a lot of them don't vote, so that doesn't help. And so what is voting in Arizona is a very conservative electorate. But that electorate is changing, and, and the more Arizona Latinos, Mexican Americans running for office, the more that state will be blue. So I, I get your point. Okay. Right. Um, I have to say that he, uh, what I think is he, he was mentioned the South as geographically the South of the United States, oh. not the Southern states like uh, Louisiana, but uh, all, because he, he mentioned that the states that used to be from Mexico, right. like California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Texas. Okay, but you know, those states are becoming more and more democratic. I know Arizona not, but Obama won New Mexico, he won Colorado, so did Clinton. Uh, they won Utah, Clinton won Utah, if you can believe that. More Latinos there. Of course, California. Texas, you know, that's going to take 20 years. But Texas is the fastest growing Latino population, and many of them are Democrat. But the danger that the Democrats have, if there's a perception that they don't want to pass immigration reform, that, you know, they, they're for it, but they don't want to push it, Latinos remember. And, and, and what I've said to my party is I said, you know, the big issue is deportations right now. Uh, White House, if you're not going to pass immigration reform, at least ease up on the deportations. You know, especially of kids, especially of families. Why do you want to separate families? I think Gregorio told me about a, there's a Harvard student and they want to deport his mother. You know, that makes no sense. That Harvard kid's going to come back. He's not going to go back to the U.S. Harvard degree? Or, ya tú me dijiste, no? El tú, Gregorio, tú, no? Okay. From an investment point of view, which kind of renewable energy should investors focus in Mexico? I know making of solar cells panels is profitable in Mexico, but it is... Uh, but is solar energy viable for use in Mexico today? If not, when? No, it's very viable for you right now. I mean, your governor is very interested in solar, and I think that makes sense. Solar concentrated solar, solar storage, um, all kinds of solar. You have the sun here, 
And you have the technology, you have the transportation links, you have the market in California. No, I think you've got to take advantage of solar right now. No se esperen. But I think this governor, I mean, at least with the Spanish company, Avengoa, he's looking at a big solar project in the Mexicali area. I don't know if you're doing some here. But I went south a little bit to Tecate. I mean, you've got great, great potential for solar there, not just because of the sun, but the land. No hay nada por mucho, mucho, no hay nada ahí. That's where you want solar factories, where, where there's water, good roads, but it's open. You've got that. So wind también, you know, wind, it's, I won't say it gets awfully windy here, but you have the, its technology. That, that is needed there, the turbines and the research. No? Am I right? Sí. Que no maten a los pájaros. That was a problem first, but now they figured out not to kill the birds. So, no, I don't know how they do it. They feed them before they fly. Y hay varias preguntas eh, relacionadas con su futuro político, el de usted. ¿El ¿Cuál futuro es? político? El suyo. ¿Cuáles son sus planes, sus perspectivas, su futuro político? Varias preguntas, planteadas de manera diferente, pero todas sobre lo mismo. Yo estuve en la política 32 años seguidos, seguidos, desde eh, me elegí al Congreso americano a los 31, fui congresista 15 años, luego embajador de Naciones Unidas, secretario de Energía, eh, gobernador en Nuevo México, Corrí para la presidencia, duré nomás tres primarias, uh, pero ahora, los últimos tres años, he estado en el sector privado, uh, di unas clases en Baker Institute en in Houston, uh, soy consultor de, consejero de varias compañías de energía, principalmente startups de solar energy efficiency, uh, trabajo con una compañía que se llama APCO, Relaciones Públicas, uh, Tengo dos fundaciones. Me interesa mucho, por ejemplo, en las fundaciones, relaciones que Estados Unidos tiene con países que no nos llevamos, como Corea del Norte, como Cuba. Creo que es importante tener diálogo con países que, que no nos llevamos bien. Uh, además, tengo otra fundación con el actor uh, Robert Redford. ¿Saben quién es? No, el Sundance Kid. Y lo que estamos tratando de hacer es, a ver si nos ayudan en esto, proteger los caballos salvajes, que no los maten. Los reúnen en Estados Unidos y los mandan aquí a México, a Canadá, que los maten, to slaughter them. You don't want that to happen. Help me with that. Don't tell them, don't slaughter them here. Get, don't slaughter them, period. So we have a, a foundation that does that. Estoy muy contento. Mira, por la política ahorita, not yet. Mira, he said, time's up, they want me to get out of here. Pero todavía tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta. En tres palabras, ¿cómo describiría Tijuana? Ok. Dynamic, dinámica. One. Two. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Great potential is the second. But you have to do it. And three... Unidad. I think you're unified. I see here empresarios, people, uh, students, university people, uh, jóvenes. No veo ningún viejito aquí. Yo soy el único. I think you're also part of that population. You're giving a lot of opportunities to women. I notice here that you have a lot of women CEOs, women presidents. That's very important. You have a lot of women running for office. You know, that's one thing that I've said to Latina women in the United States. I said, you should stop just being the advisors to candidates. Métanse ustedes. Get in there. There's still a little hesitancy. But here, I think you're seeing it. I just found out that, for instance, in Monterrey, in Nuevo León, two of the main candidates running for office, one is... Uh, if he runs, is uh, Ildefonso Guajardo, and the other is a woman who's mayor who might win the governorship. And you're seeing more of that in Mexican politics. And I think that's good. But I think here, uh, Don José, que no están creciendo mucho las mujeres en términos de 
de autoridad y poder? A ver, diga algo. I, I haven't heard ni lo he conocido. Véngase para acá. Pues bueno, ya que va a subir don José, eh, pues le pedimos también que lo acompañe eh, Vicky Carlson, CEO de Elite San Diego, Cristina Hermosillo, presidenta de Daytac y consejera de Tijuana Innovadora, para entregar el reconocimiento al señor Bill Richardson. Y también que lo acompañe Salvador Morales, que fue el que hizo las preguntas controversiales de este día, que es uno de nuestros voluntarios. He's a very... Es un buen preguntón, ¿no? Venga, let's go to the Hemos tenido una plática extraordinaria de un hombre extraordinario. Yo, toda mi vida, yo quise conocerlo. Yo lo seguí, leí de las cosas, de cómo rescataba a prisioneros, de cómo hizo esfuerzos y con su, y con su voluntad, y aparte llamándose mexicano, latino. Es un orgullo para nosotros y usted y su simpatía y su carácter es fantástico, la verdad. Yo quiero pedirle, por favor, al presentón que le dé esta escultura, la hizo el arquitecto Jack Wiener. Es una escultura que se llama Wiener, no, no, él preguntó nomás. Esta escultura la hizo el arquitecto y muestra el orgullo, es, una, es el ganador, se llama Wiener. Es el ganador, es el orgullo de ser... Eh, mexicano en Estados Unidos es un homenaje. Por otro lado, would I would like you to say something. Thank you, gracias, Jose. Uh, it is my pleasure. I'm here from the San Diego side, and I'm with Lead San Diego, and it's our honor to be here as part of the Tijuana Novadara. I'm uh, on the advisory council, and you mentioned also many things about the greater region, and that's part of our goal is the sustainability of our greater region, being San Diego and, and Northern Baja. You mentioned two people also, Betty, who your sister worked with, who we honored uh, as we, we ha our cross-border relationship is uh, very important to us. Jose Galicot also, we honored him in San Diego because of what he's doing here in Tijuana to uh, bridge the gap here. And uh, you also mentioned Richard Kai, who is one of our advisory council members. So we really appreciate everything that we do together. So thank you for the honor of being here and speaking on for both, for both sides. Buenas tardes. Para mí es un honor estar aquí. Yo represento a un organismo empresarial de Tijuana. Nuestra misión es promover inversión para nuestra ciudad. Y me da mucho gusto que durante su plática este, varios de sus comentarios coinciden con nuestro discurso actual de, de venta de Tijuana y de los esfuerzos que realizamos todos los días para promover nuestra ciudad. Este, pero también quería pedirle un saludo para mi amiga que está conmigo aquí el día de hoy, Estela, y que participó en su campaña para la presidencia de Estados Unidos. Ella estuvo en sus primarios y es fan. Eh, ustedes ya saben, ustedes son cómplices míos. Perdón, don José, don José, perdóneme la interrupción, pero es que fíjese que tengo aquí una sorpresa y dicen por ahí que Gandaya mata carita, me va a tocar a mí. Es una sorpresa. El Honorable Ayuntamiento de Tijuana reconoce como visitante distinguido a Bill Richardson, agradeciendo su visita a nuestra ciudad de Tijuana, 23 de octubre del 2014, y firma doctor Jorge Astiazarán Orsí, presidente municipal de Tijuana, quien no pudo estar esta tarde, pero se lo manda con mucho cariño. Como visitante distinguido. Pero la verdad es que no es verdad. La verdad es que no más se lo prestamos, nos quedamos con sus papeles, <risa> le quitamos todo y le vamos a dar una sorpresa. Ven, venga, por favor. Le ayudo, don José. Todos ustedes ya saben, son mis cómplices, ya saben lo que hacemos aquí. Come on here. Okay. Una. Una, dos, tres. De eso se trata. De eso se trata. Tijuana Innovador es un esfuerzo muy 